Hi, everybody. My name is Zoltan Feldman, and I'm here with Ethan Kalb. Today, we are joined by our special guest, Carla Hall. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, for those who are watching and may not know who Carla is, uh, Carla Hall made her debut into the mainstream by appearing on season five and eight of Top Chef on Bravo. After her time competing, she then was a co-host on ABC's The Chew and made numerous appearances on other cooking shows on the Food Network, as well as publishing a couple cookbooks and a children's book just last year, right? Yes. All right. Um, so to get us started, um, as I said, you competed on both season five and eight of Top Chef. Um, and while you were competing, you constantly reminded the audience that your philosophy when it comes to cooking is to always cook with love. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell me um, how you applied that philosophy to like all the challenges that you had to go through while competing? You know, that was hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. No, I think that for me, uh, and it's really hard to do in a competition, but at the height of when I was competing, and thinking about my spirituality and, and what I could control and to remind myself why I enjoyed cooking in the first place. And I knew that um, if you didn't put the love in it, mm -hmm. the only thing you should be making was a reservation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so even though I think when I was on Top Chef and I, I, I felt like I was afraid of being sent home and afraid of, you know, the judges and Padma and Tom, like, no, this is terrible. You know, I went through that, but I think when I thought I was going to go home and I didn't go home and the biggest fear and was that I didn't actually die on Top Chef. <laughs> I know it sounds really crazy, <laughs> but I was standing up there at the judges table like, wait, nobody's died here. That's my biggest fear. And then I was free to really cook from my heart. Oh, amazing. Um, and through those two seasons that you were on, what was maybe one of the most memorable things um, from competing that you remember? Cooking for Jacques Pepin. Oh, okay. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so that was the challenge where we, um, Wiley Dufresne, and I can't believe that I actually, I mean, it's, it's like just yesterday, Wiley Dufresne did this um, challenge and we had to do molecular gastronomy, and that, that wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was doing sort of very homey comfort food. And I made green eggs and ham. <laughs> and where I took the egg white, I put some dye in it. And I said spinach or something like that. And then whizzed it up in the blender. Um, I had separated the egg, put it in the pan, and then put the yolk in so it looked like a green egg, a fried egg and ham, and served it to him. And I won the challenge. Yeah. And the, the, the advantage that I got was to be able to pull the knife of the Last Supper, we had to make a, the Last Supper for someone, and I pulled Jacques Pepin, and I could trade it if I wanted to trade it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I'm cooking for Jacques Pepin, and it was squab and peas, and I love peas. <laughs> and I can't imagine, it's like, the thing is, to cook for Jacques Pepin is one thing, but to, ha to be able to make something that you know you love, that, I mean, come on, it was gonna be good because you already love the thing. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who wouldn't do justice to those peas. They don't <laughs> like peas. I like peas. <laughs> I mean, I don't like peas, so. See, you, so, you're, yeah. you're <laughs> not at a dis oh, disadvantage. Yeah. Yeah. Peas, peas are good. Peas are really good. <laughs> peas are good. Yeah, exactly. people, people always come up to me and they're like, how did you make those peas? I remember being on the platform in Washington, D.C., and there was all these people getting off a train because I would take the train from New York to D.C., mm -hmm. and they're yelling. He's like, how did you make the peas? <laughs> he's like, like yelling at like, all these people. Like, there are like, at least 10 people between us. I said, first thing, don't overcook them. <laughs> the next thing, tarragon, <laughs> butter, and thyme. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like you said, you had you know, people screaming at you as they're watching you on TV, and in um, season eight, you were voted as the fan favorite chef. Yes. Um, what did that accomplishment feel like to you personally? I mean, I, I was amazed, I was grateful, I felt like, I, th I think when something like that happens, you almost don't realize how many people are watching a show and voting for you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's a little bit surreal. You know, I remember the first time when I left, when I was out in the world and I had on a hat and I had on a, uh, like a scarf around my head mm -hmm. and a lady says, Carla, and I'm like, 
how, wait, how does she know me? Am I, do I have on a name tag? Um, so for me, it, it's still sometimes I forget, and somebody's like, "Who do you who?" I'm like, "Who?" Like W H O instead of W <laughs> instead of H O O. Um, but it was a little surreal. But because I did win fan favorite, I also won um, won, won um, a seat at the table at the Chew. Yeah, and um, you brought that up very perfectly. Um, so you, after Top Chef, you went on to host The Chew. You made so many guest appearances on different like cooking specials from Thanksgiving to Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, how were you able to like tell your personal story through co-hosting or like making little appearances here and there? I think that uh, it didn't happen initially. I think um, I was always, and I, I didn't know that I needed to be empowered by having a storyteller help me. Mm -hmm. um, and the storytellers, when you're working on the show, are the producers. And so for me, I was always and constantly asking for a black producer or someone who understood my background as a black woman, as a southerner, um, somebody who was in their 50s. <laughs> you know, all of that helps to tell your story. And so once I realized that it was important for me to be seen and to tell my story, that's when I started fighting for fighting. Um, asking for different um, field pieces. And I remember doing a piece. We were doing something on um, President's Day. So everybody picked the president. <laughs> Who would I pick? <laughs> what president would I pick? Probably Barack Obama, right? But I mean, at the time, mm -hmm. I was like, ah. <laughs> so um, I picked um, Phyllis Wheatley. Because that <laughs> she wasn't a president, mm -hmm. but I picked somebody that meant something to me. That was mm -hmm. the dorm that I stayed in at Howard University, and so it was it was little things like that. And I, I remember for for Black History Month one time I had an actor from a black actor from Hamilton come on the show, and they were like, "Yeah, this is a great you know Black History Month." I'm like, "Why? Because Hamilton? Why?" <laughs> ah. So I mean, I think uh, just having people think about the perspective. Um, was why I was fighting for a storyteller who looked like me. Of course. Yeah, so you recently released a picture book called Carla in the Christmas Cornbread. What was the thought process behind making this picture book, you know, for kids or whatever? Well, initially, I wanted to do a, a, um, a memoir. Mm. And that was, that was the route that I was going to take. And then um, it... It, it turned out, we tur well, we turned it in, and they were like, no. Um, and I still had to work on it. And so part of my story, I actually ended up um, working with a, uh, an author, uh, Kristen Hartke, who helped tell that story, because she was going to work on, the, she was gonna work on the, the memoir with me. And I'd always want to do it. I'd always wanted to do a children's story, because I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was, in grade school, and I always drew. That was my thing. 4-H, you know, people are farming. I was drawing cartoons. <laughs> Y'all 4-Hers? I was, yeah. yeah I see? Yeah. I'm, I'm, not really I, I'm, good board. I'm not really a good drawer. So. But you could do, do, what about I, raising pigs? <laughs> cows? No, I, I was raising goats, and we raised goats. pigs, and we had a barn full of cows. So that was my little gig. And you were the, doing the smaller projects, right? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Um, if I may, you also, like I said, have many cookbooks out. What mm -hmm. was the difference between writing like a cookbook and this children's book? Um, a cookbook takes a long time and a cookbook has generally four seasons of food. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that for this picture book we had one recipe. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> it was like a breeze. Um, so that was that was the first thing about that and you don't have to worry about the season. So with the, with the Christmas cornbread, I'm always talking about should there be sugar in the cornbread but in this one because Santa was going to get, I hate to spoil it for y'all, <laughs> Santa, um, Santa is getting um, a sweet cornbread instead of a cookie, mm -hmm. so that's what I give Santa. And it tells a little bit about my history, and, it, and so that recipe is really packed with cultural history for me as well as family history. Amazing. Yeah, so, pack, so packing your personal history into this children's book, you know, sort of inspiring people to... Yes, exactly. And I also wanted to talk about Black Santa. And, and even though, tongue in cheek, I remember the first time that I mentioned Black Santa when I was on The Chew. It was the first year of The Chew. And, um, and I, I, I happened to mention, yeah, like Black Santa. And our producer, our executive producer, looks at me, oh, Carla, you're so funny. You're so funny. I'm like, 
what do you mean? I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. There's a black Santa. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah. well, you do not know black Santa? Well, <laughs> he's from Australia. So, I mean, I, I, I wanted to sort of talk about how Santa is, is just like in your image. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I'm black, I have a black Santa. You could have a white Santa. Somebody else could have a... Uh, a Mexican Santa, or, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the idea of it. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, you're going to be speaking here with at Miami University for your for Miami University's lecture series, which is mm -hmm. titled "Food and Fashion: Finding Purpose Through Passion." So, like, what are some of the concepts that you like want to address the audience for this lecture series speech? Well, I want to talk about my path in food and how I started out as a caterer and I went on to do all these other things, Top Chef, The Chew, you know, now food, television. But also along that journey, I, I, I modeled. So mm -hmm. modeling became, modeling was first before I started working in food. And, and it has continued sort of as a way that I express myself. And I think that, and what I, what I hope to drive home is a lot of my fashion sense also comes from a very strong sense of self, who I am, who I authentically, um, because a lot of times I think we fall prey to trends. I don't do trends. <laughs> I mean, I might do trends. Okay, so I did cookie butter. I did a cookie butter, you know. Okay, everybody's doing those boards. Okay, I did that. Yeah, trends are everywhere. Uh, trends are everywhere. You yeah. all are driving the trends, and we're getting on them because we need likes. Yes. But. Yeah. I know, like, That's the, true. You're about, like, the cookie boards where everyone brings, like, a different board to a party, right? Is that what you're talking about? No, I did a cookie butter board. Oh, so, you know, like, the butter, butter boards? I don't, Have you actually. Seen it? I haven't. So, it's a board where you're putting um, smears of different butters. Okay. And like all kind of flavored compound butters. Okay. Um, so I did one with cookie butter. Okay. So I'm not going to spoil it because some people, I'm, <laughs> we're asking them to, it's this ombre of cookie butters, but guess what the flavors are. I'm not going to out myself and tell anybody right now because you may try to win. I don't know if there's a prize, but I'm just saying. It's <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, back to your lecture series tonight. What, what are you all planning to talk about? What are you hoping that students take away from your, your speech? I'm hoping that they take away, uh, I'm 58, and it's taken me decades to truly, truly be my authentic self, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't authentic along the way, mm -hmm. but all of my experiences have brought me to this point. But I think the, the, the best thing about getting older is the wisdom that you collect along the way and you're honestly too tired to be somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's perfectly said. Um, and I think that's all the questions we have for you today. So thank you again for joining us here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you. it. And uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can find uh, more MTN content on our YouTube page. And thank you for watching.